Good evening, good evening, and welcome to another beautiful Monday night, April, new month, uh, new day, new night. Here, sidewalk. I mean, here on Wednesday, Wednesday Monday night, on the West Side uh, Bible study. Tonight we, tonight we are going to. Before we start our communion, as we know, our first Monday of every month we have a communion. Before we start with the communion, we have to share a news with everybody out there who's watching us live. If you are watching us live, please like and share, like and share, so others in your network and friends and family in the network can also be blessed by the teaching tonight. But we lost one of our members today. Actually, we didn't lose her, per se. Sister Zepur, for some of us, is uh, sisters, or some of us is mom, for some of us is Tantik, for some of us is Morkur, for some of us is uh, Imam. And uh, she went to be with the Lord today. And today is a glorious day because it's the day after Easter. Today is the day after Resurrection Day. Uh, if anybody could pick a day to die, today is the best day to die. If you are planning, why don't you put your request in the future, the Lord to give you to take you home the day after Resurrection Sunday. Because you can't, just this perfect day for it. The Lord, today is the Resurrection Sunday day after. So, you know, we are this Passover just passed, and this was a Passover feast over the weekend. The Passover just finished, and we had the Resurrection Sunday. Our Lord Jesus Christ died for us and rose on the third day. And, uh, and, and today our sister also departed to go to be with the Lord on a perfect day. So she had her family with her, her daughter, her daughters, because it's Catherine's daughter too, and her son all by her all day yesterday they celebrated easter together and today she departed she's been suffering for a while she had beaten cancer uh years ago she overcame it she did wonderful she was a staple in our bible study group she was uh, a voice we never missed and her wonderful desserts and cookies and things that she brought all the time and everything else she cooked for us and a great hospitality at her home. So many things we can go on and say. Probably we got to leave some of it for the day of her, uh, you know, uh, celebration of life or funeral, whatever you want to call it. But in meanwhile, we just want to share with the world here that that voice that used to be here with us, part of us, and maybe if you ever go to all our videos, you can hear her reading. She's there. So I believe she's going to be fourth person from our group who departed. Bill? In our group, we, we lost we lost Onik first, and then uh, Coco and Silva, his wife. Yeah. Zephyr will be the number four. Yeah. You're Japanese. Oh, Noriko, oh, Noriko. Yeah, so she. Yes. So Noriko. So yeah, she will be the number five then. Oh well, Noriko's husband, so she'll number six. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, boy. Uh, well, that means uh, we need six new members to join because we're losing. You know, they're going home. Bible study is lucrative heaven. Everybody wants to go to heaven. <laughs> so, um, well, we know where she is. That's the good news, that we know where she is. Uh, we are sad because we're going to miss her. We are sad because we are not going to hear her voice and see her again. We are sad for that. I'm so glad I was able to visit her a couple times last week. But we're happy because we know where she is. We're happy because for assurance, I can assure you where she is. I can guarantee you. That's the beauty about, about this. Is that even though she is not with us, and she's always going to be with us, even though she has departed, but she's only just right here. Even though she is not here physically, but she is with the Lord. She is with the Lord. And... Right after Resurrection Sunday, yesterday, Easter, and today. So our tonight's study is going to be dedicated to her and her memory. And also we are going to have communion. And, you know, just to kind of honor this whole package deal. Today is a... I'm getting teary-eyed. I'm getting excited. It's a great thing. So 
Uh, if you are home and watching us, please uh, grab yourself a uh, cracker or piece of bread or lavash or whichever you have, flat bread preferably, and some juice or wine, whichever you have, a very little, of course. And so let us uh, do what the Lord had asked us to do. And literally, it was last week, He had told us on the Last Supper, which was several days ago, do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for so much. Thank you for everything you've given to us. Thank you for showing us your, your love, your grace. Father, we ask you tonight to you have peace on Sarkhanian's family and that Zephyr is with you, O oh Lord. We are grateful for that. We ask you to keep her and keep her happy for all the days until we see her again, till we meet again, till our time comes. Father, we ask that you bless us here, her second family, her, her extended family, her church family, all of us here. And may you give us the understanding as we have that we should be rejoicing and, and be in peace that you had taken her home. We are grateful for everything you've done. We're just going to say, Father, may you decrease me and increase you. Let this tonight be all of you, Lord. Father, we come to you as sinners. Yesterday was Resurrection Sunday and your son rose. But last week, several days ago, he had told us, do this in remembrance of me. And when he said that, he said, just cleanse your home. That's what the Passover was. Cleansing of the home, cleansing of the yeast, and cleansing of the, of the sin. We ask, Lord, that we're all sinners and we come to you with our open hearts and open mind. We ask you to forgive our sins that we committed an hour ago, minute ago, and a day ago, or a week ago, or a month ago. Father, may you just have mercy upon us, forgive our sins, so we can accept your Son fully in our bodies to become one with you. With that, Jesus took the bread, and he lifted it up, and he said, Father, bless this. This is my body. It's going to be broken for you. Eat of this to be one with me. He broke the bread and he passed it on to his disciples. Oh, wow. God, you're so good. <laughs> oh my gosh, seriously. Wow. Thank you. We couldn't design it if we wanted to. So after he passed it to his 12 disciples, he took the cup of the vine, of the juice of the vine or the grape, which is the wine. And he said, and this was the third cup, if you are students of the Bible, it was the third cup during Passover meal, which is the final cup of the resurrection cup. And he said, I will not be drinking of this until I meet you again in the kingdom of God. And then he said, this is my blood will be shed for you. Drink of this and eat of this. Be one with me. May the Lord's body and blood be one with us to unite us all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all and thank you. Thank Bill, you. when you get a chance to turn on the camera so we can start. Good evening and welcome to 
Monday night Bible study here at St. Giragos. First Monday of April and right after Passover and right after Easter. Father, may you decrease me and increase you. Let this teaching be all of you and none of me. That final chapter of Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 24, so we can conclude the life of King David in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Open up your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 24. 2 Samuel chapter 24. Today we are going to finish the book of the second book of Samuel, God's willing. And by the end of uh, study, hopefully we'll decide where we start, which book next week. With that being said, last time we finished by studying all the men of the valor of King David and his fighting men. And how they represented each one of them by their actions and their names, how they were, and how we should be in, in the ministry. I give you a Bible. What happened? Nothing. Where's the Bible? So, we studied all these men, his valor, groups of three, of three men, captains and, and uh, uh, generals of his army, and what they have done, and how their names had added up together to represent God's kingdom and how it is that we serve in the ministry. Their names and their actions represented our life in ministry. Our life in ministry came through their, in, you know, the same thing that their functions as a physical, what do I always say? In the Old Testament, everything that applies to the Hebrews in physical sense, how does that apply to us? Spiritual. Spiritual. Amen to that. So that's exactly one of the things that we, we had studied, that all their actions, all their whatever they did, this man and how they served the king, we must serve the king of our king of all kings, Lord Jesus Christ, in our ministry to the Lord. Amen. With that, let's go to verse chapter, verse 1 of chapter 24 in Second Samuel. <clears throat> Again, the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go, number Israel and Judah. Okay. Here, if you, some of your Bibles will have little numbers and notes and, and parentheses and things, will tell us that this was a mistranslation. And unfortunate, because in the first Chronicles chapter 21, we get to see that Satan is the one who aroused David to number the people. So here, it says the Lord aroused David. It wasn't. So, but if you read the first Chronicles, which is, remember like it was chapter 23 or to 18, or chapter, which one was it? The, the song that David wrote in verse chapter 22. There was the same as Psalm 18. So that also is the same thing here. This, this particular verse or this note is also in Chronicles. And the Chronicles gives us a better understanding. And it tells us that Satan enticed uh, David to number the people. Why? Anybody has a clue, idea why? Go ahead. Division? No. Division? Mm -mm. The number of people? Yeah. Division? Which means census. Why did David ask for that? But just so you know, it wasn't God's telling him to do it. To judge him? Maybe the number of souls that he needs to like, win over was no. towards the Satan? Towards Satan? No. No, why would Satan entice David to do that? What was David applying? Mm, no. You know, he wanted to number the men. Fighting men. Yeah, but what was that all about? It's more Then you're weaker, and that way the number decides the victory. Judge not God. 
CC badge for that. Good job. Bravo. I'm impressed. Yes. That's exactly it. It's pride. He wanted to know how much, how many people he has in his army or could fight for him. How many is available? Okay. So, so we see that he wanted to, according to here, he sent his people or to go count in every county, in every city, in every neighborhood, how many fighting men that there is. Take a note. Oh, how many Census. David? So it was David's, pride. David's pride. Yes. Okay. David wants to, he's like, of course, he wants to show off how big of a fighting okay. force does he have. Okay. See? You are saying Satan. That's what Satan is the one who gave this, this enticement into David's mind. Okay. This idea kind of was input into, into motion through Satan's move into David's mind. We're going to find that out how in a few minutes. We're going to find out in a few minutes that it, that it was Satan, it wasn't God. Two and three. For the king said to them, the captain of the host which was with him, go now through all the tribes of Israel from Dan even to... Beersheba, Beersheba. Mm -hmm. and number ye the people that I may know the number of the people. And Joab said, Joab. Joab said unto the king, Now the Lord thy God add unto the people how many soever they may be, and hundredfold. I know you have a different version. If you read this Bible, yeah. I will know what you're saying. Hundredfold. And that the eyes of my lord the king may see it. But why doth my king, the king, delight in this thing? Thank you. Joab questioned the king saying, What are you doing, my lord? You know, may God multiply the people, but why are you counting them? What's the purpose? Joab even questioning this to David, like, why? What's the purpose behind what you're asking? Because it's like, it's not like you. This is out of character. And he says, let God add. If we need, whoever we need, God is going to provide. So why are we trying to number them? See, because remember, they're supposed to be the, a, a, a nation, a nation ruled by God. And God is the one who fights for them, protects them. Okay? You know, they have theocracy. But God is the one, Theo. God is the one who, who, who manages them, runs them, takes care of them, protects them. So they're not supposed to be doing, they, that's why they, have to, they always have to go to God to ask, should we fight, should we not fight? Do we go, we don't go. What are we supposed to do? So whenever they did, what was the answer? Always they won. Whenever they didn't, they went on their own, what was the results? They lost. So this is exactly our own life, brothers and sisters. Our life, same thing. If you make your own decisions without asking God, it's like, a, oops, you don't know what happens. You got 50-50 chance. But if you ask God, then God will supply, God will show, God will take care of it, and He will run it for you. In that case, you don't have to worry about it. Even if it doesn't work out the way it is supposed to be, it's not your fault because God doesn't want you to have that. You meet a boy, you like him. You have a choice. Either you decide to like him and pursue, or you ask God, is he the right one? And if he is the right one, and if God's... God will make that facilitated to be perfectly. He will say that he will show you. But if he's not the one, he will not make that happen. Because you trusted him, then you cannot be upset. As cute as he could be. Doesn't matter. Verses 4 to 9. Nevertheless, the king word prevailed against Joab and against the captain of the army. Therefore Joab and the captain of the army went out from the presence of the king to count the people of the Israel. And they crossed over the Jordan and the and uh, camped in Arubel, on the right side of the town which is in the midst of the raven of God and toward Gezer. Then they came to Gilad and to the land of Tati, Hodesh. They came to Dan, John, and around the Sidon. 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 
And Bravo. they came to the stronghold of Tyre and to all the cities of the Hivites, Hivites and the Canaanites. Then they went out to South Judah as far as Beersheba. Beersheba. Mm -hmm. So when they had gone through all the land, they came to Jerusalem at the end of the ninth month and it went uh, and twenty days. Then Joab gave the son of the number of the people to the king. The sum. The sum. The sum of the number. And there were. Oh, and there finish. were in Israel eighty. No, eight hundred. Eight hundred thousand valiant men who drew the sword, and the men of Judah were five hundred thousand men. Thank you. So you see, by the way, as you realize, uh, they went throughout all the borders, and, and uh, those Canaanites are the people of Lebanon. They were called, considered the Canaanites, in case you were wondering back then. So here, census showed after they traveled throughout all the regions, and, and this kind of gives us the borders of King David's reign at the time of throughout the way, all the way down to uh, Sidon, all the way to Sida, Lebanon, South, you know, to southern Lebanon, and all through Jordan area and Syria. And finally, we come to 1.3 million fighting men available at his disposal. So it took them several months, as you see, to go do the census. It wasn't like now computerized, you know, why don't you, you know, uh, put your ballot or, or census, fill it up. They had to go everywhere. And it kind of gives us the whole borders of King David's kingdom to see from where to where to where to where to where. Because they had to go all the way to the each border, all the way to wherever they had the Israelites, from, from Judah to northern Israel and all the tribes, and find out that they had 1.3 million fighting force, fighting men that they was in his disposal. Pretty good sized army at that time, even today, it's a good sized army. I mean, if we had 1.3 million fighting soldiers in Armenia, we will not be losing anything, for example. But, you know, yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, to kind of give you a, a, a picture. Um, so, anyway, verse 10. And David's heart condemned him after he had numbered the people. So David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now I pray, O Lord, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have been very foolish. So now pay attention. You see what's going on here. David realized what he had done. Remember earlier, verse 1, it's a mistranslation. Because you see, David realized what he did was wrong. David's action... David's action, no side talking, please, during Bible study. David's action was wrong, and we see it right here in verse 10, because he is asking for forgiveness. David realized that what he had done was wrong against the Lord, and he confessed his sin, submitting to the prompting of Satan to get you know, statistics, so he can be more prideful king. That was exactly what his purpose of the census was. So he can be prideful king. So he can say, you know what? I have 1.3 million fighters, man. What are you trying to do? Who do you think you are? Kind of thing. So, but then he realized that was wrong. So he asked for forgiveness to the Lord. He said, I, you know, so he literally broke down. That's what makes David different than anybody else. The difference about David and anybody else, the reason the Bible calls him, he has a heart after, after the Lord, uh, the Lord's heart, is because he always knows when he makes a mistake, he comes and confesses and asks for forgiveness. Exactly what the Bible tells us he does, he did. So that's why he's always prompted to do the right thing, to prompt him to go and ask for forgiveness, even though he was a bigger mess than most everybody else we write about. He was a bigger mess. That's what I love about him because so I feel like, oh my God, if David's safe, I'm good. No, I think God chose David because he was more like what he foresaw us being. So imperfect and making decisions and Jesus dying for us and us repenting. Repenting, yes. So it's, it's a CC badge for that one, actually. It's a very good, it's a good observation. Yes, foreshadowing the future mm -hmm. of us Christians to, to come to realization when we do something wrong because Jesus paid the price asking for forgiveness. That's, yes, it's exact. David did that in the he Old constantly Testament. Constantly made mistakes. Constantly made mistakes and constantly went to God and like, ah, oh, I did it again. I messed up. And he asked for forgiveness. Verse 11 and 12. King David himself. Now, when 
when David arose from the morning, the Lord of the Lord came to the prophet God. David's uh, sir saying, Go and tell David, thus says the Lord, I offer you the, the, uh, three. three things. Choose one of them for yourself, and I will do it to you. So God came to David and told them. No, that's it, just to 12. God forgives his people. He gives peace to his people, but he doesn't pamper them because it's, it has to be consequences of sin to be dealt with. See, God forgives us. God, he is patient with us. He likes to give us peace, but he doesn't want to pamper us all the time. The reason is because there's consequences of sin that has to be dealt with. In Hebrews chapter 12, Verses 5 to 8 tells us, For whom the Lord loveth, he chastened and scourged every son whom he received. So if you are calling yourself a daughter or son of God, that means you also have to accept the punishment when you do something wrong in life. What does that mean? For the same thing what the Bible teaches us, right? You know, in, in Proverbs it says, If you don't, Chasing your son or your daughter when they're young. If you don't straighten them when they're young, what do you expect from them later on in life? You have to do them for their own good. You cannot just let them do whatever they want to. Okay, it's okay, honey. Well, it also says if you don't chase them, you don't love them. Exactly, we're the same thing because we because God is the way with us the same way. Look what God did. He went to his prophet and he told him, Go tell David. He has three, let him choose. He's gonna choose a punishment. Literally, it's like you bring your own, like you know, Arsene did something. And dad comes home, your mom will tell your dad, Arsen did this, this is something I couldn't hide because it was pretty bad. So your dad will say, Arsen John, Ari, Ari, come sit down. Let's talk. Yeah, that's okay. Come sit. Let's talk. Okay, listen, son. You got three choices. But it's going to be one of the three. It's going to be three different punishments. You choose which one you want. Pick one. Pick your poison. Pick your poison. I remember those days. Mine was weekly. Or maybe daily, but weekly. So a lot of options. But I didn't have much options left. Usually I run them out. So let's see verse 13, Bigfoot. And see what kind of punishment he gets. So God came to David. Told him and said of him, Shall seven years of famine come unto thee in thy land, or wilt thou flee three months before thine enemies while they pursue thee, or that there be three days pestilence in thy land? Now advise and see what answer I shall return to him that sent thee. Thank you. For his punishment, David had to choose between those three options. One is, God says, you want the seven years of famine come to your land? Or, or we, uh, you have to run away from your, uh, from your enemies for 11 months or so? Or, or he says, should three days of uh, a plague come to the land? So let's see what David's going to pick from the three. 14. It's God speaking, but through David's seer. Yeah. And everybody keeps saying to call him God. No, Gad, Gad. His name is Gad. David. By the way, Gad, excuse me, whoever's writing notes, Gad means good fortune, good luck. That seer or the prophet or the person who's talking with God, you know, whatever God's telling him. So this guy's name is Gad, G-A-D, not God, G-O-D. And, but he is talking what God is telling and his name is his name means good fortune, good luck, Gad. He's a Chinese cookie. Go on. <laughs> and David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Please let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. But do not let me fall into the hand of man. So basically he said, let it be something with the Lord. So he ruled out being chased by his enemies. And let God be merciful in the other two, whichever he chooses. So the, him being chased by the enemies, running in. Remember the guy who was, he, was, he, he, he runs from his son. Okay, he's, he's, he's like, I'm not running anymore. 
please, let not be that. It's not the punishment I want. Like that, but the problem, problem is, the pro yes, you, I understand that. But you know what he's understanding from it though? That will be something in, in man's mercy. What they will do to him. Versus in God, that's why he said, let God be merciful. So if he's going to be three days of plague, let it be some gentle plague, nothing too serious. Or if it's going to be seven years of famine, hopefully it's not that real, or maybe he cut the short. So he, I know you're right, he should have picked the one that just reflects on him. But he will never reflect on him. That means him, his whole family, everyone's going to run. It won't be just him. So he chose to put his life in mercy of God instead of mercy of men. And mercy of God. For smart move. So, well, hey, God gave him three choices. So he had to choose one. So he chose two out of three. Yeah, he chose two out of three. 15 to 17. Go ahead. And so, so the Lord sent five upon his rent for the morning till the appointed time. From then to the Sheba, 70,000 men of the people of God. And when the angel spread out his hand over Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the destruction and said to the angel who was destroying the people, It is enough. Now we pray no man. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Arona and Jebusai. The David, then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, Surely I have sinned and I have done wickedly. But this sheep, what have they done? Let your hand, I pray, be against me and against my father's house. Thank you. Now he's answering what you wanted him to say. Yeah. Okay, good. But pay attention before we go to details of what this is all about. Uh, in verse 16, if you see, it says, The Lord sent an angel to do this, 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 right? Mm -hmm. This killing, this plague. Like the Passover angel, remember angel of death? Same thing here, it's probably the same guy, same angel. But pay attention, it's not capital A-N-G-E-L, right? It's a small letter angel. It's not the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I'm trying to say. Because a lot of times, you, if you are following, if you are really picky student, you will say, but didn't you say the angel of the Lord you mentioned before, we were in such and such class, is, you know, uh, Christophany of Lord Jesus Christ? I would say yes, but that one is capital L, capital O, cap, you know, and, and it's also capital A-N-G-E-L. So that's how we know it's the angel of the Lord in the caps is the Lord Jesus Christ. Christophany, which is, is incarnate Jesus before he was born as a human being on earth, okay? Him as visiting as an angel. Or in this particular case, an actual angel of death who's doing the, is the killing for, and then, uh, now, Jesus, um, David hears that there's 70,000 people died from the plague. Apparently, that's what God decided to put on them, the plague. I figured that God would pick that instead of the seven years of famine. That's too long of a punishment. And put them, he fell before the Lord. So David falls before the Lord and said, Lord, I have sinned. But that people have not done anything. It's not their fault. It's my fault. Why are they being the brunt? Why are they bearing the brunt of my punishment? You know, that's like, you know, he's like, why are they being punished for me? Punish me, please. Don't punish them. So that's what David falls on, you know, mercy. Remember, like the same with Moses had done. You know, he came to God's mercy and you know, asked for mercy for the people. He said, stop killing. That's when, you know, they were dying from the vipers. They were all looking. They were getting bitten by snakes everywhere when they were in the wilderness. And they were dying. There were thousands of them dead. And Moses falls in front of God and says, Please, you have mercy on them. You know, give them a, a chance to live. You know, they're, they're dying. Why are you doing this to them? And God told them, Okay, take bronze, pour it, make it to a snake, and put it on a pole and put it on the mountain. Anybody who looks at that snake or uh, that that's on the pole... You know, they will be, so this, the snake is the, the, the punishment. That's where the sign, and it's, they will be saved from the, that's why the pharmacy and the doctors have the sign, that snake, it's from there, okay? That snake, the sign, why you wonder, why is there a snake on this? It's because it's a sign of cure. It's a sign of cure. That's how they got cured. And cure you at the same time, exactly. That's exactly what that was. Actually, but, 
Yeah, but it's also, but that's what Jesus said, just like he says, the sign I'll give to you, he says, just like Moses lifted up the, the snake pole on the mountain, so whoever looked at that got saved, he said, the Son of Man will also be lifted up on the pole, and whoever looks at him will, will live forever and don't die. Oh, the Lord is awesome. It's so beautiful. I mean, Jesus is like, oh man, he's so good. He's like, come on now, you see that? That was basically about me. What happened back then, the snakes, you know, everybody's getting bitten. And, and what God said, bronze is what? Why is bronze? Why God said bronze? Why is bronze in the Bible? Judgment. Judgment. Bravo. Bravo. CC badge. Yes. Because of that, so they said, you know, we are saved. So he said, pour, make bronze snake, put it on a pole, put it on the, on the hill. Anybody looks at that, while they get bitten, they will live. They will not die. And that's exactly it. Everybody got saved. So the same thing. Well, yes, exactly. Remember, they made golden calf right before that. The same, the same group, the same geniuses over there to worship, right? So anyway, uh, so so David is saying, so why, so why are you punishing them? Well, David is like what? What does he represent for that nation? He is like their father, right? He's the he's the king. So the same as in our families, if a, if a father, like when a father takes their eyes off the Lord, the whole family will feel the shock and waves and bear the pain. If a father goes and gambles, there is rent money. Do you all feel it in the home? I think you would, right? Because next thing you know, there's an eviction notice on the door and, you're, and the mom's going to help the wife, there will be... What the heck is this? And why happening? Or did you all know it? Cause did you gamble our money again? And then pots and pans are hitting, and and then the kids are going, "Oh my god!" So all those things, the same concept. Yes. <laughs> uh, for me, it was more that they were the source of this pressure, so they uh, they were. Well, yes, exactly. But God had to punish. There's the punishment had to be. You see, consequences of sin. There's always some death involved. Period. This is what I do the prison ministry, and I say to all these boys that, that I'm ministering to, I say, listen, there's consequences of your sin. You, some, you go, the, God forgave you. You ask for forgiveness, God forgave you. God loves you. God is not trying to punish you. But there is a punishment that is fit for what you had done. So the sooner you accept what God, what you had done, and ask for forgiveness, and come clean, and whatever it is you have to do, just do. Bear with the consequences. If you got to do a couple of years, a couple of months, a couple of days, a couple of weeks, whatever it is, deal with it. Because we all have to pay the price so we won't do it again. That's the reason for the punishments. I mean, listen, the reason we used to get spanked is what? So we don't do it again. It's not like, oh, we do it so old. Oh, let me get spanked. I can't wait to get spanked again. The reason today's kids are so spoiled because they don't get spanked. And they should, they should, they need all they of call them. CPS. Whatever. Take their phones away, they can't call nobody. 18 to 25. Brother, it's you. Oh, Finish us up, sorry. wrap us up. Oh, Lord. I'm sorry. 18. 18. And Gad. And Gad came that day to David and said to him, Go up, erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arana, Arana, the Jebusite. So David, according to the word of God, went up as the Lord commanded. Now Arana looked and saw the king and his servants coming toward him. So Arana went out and bowed before the king with his face to the ground. Then Arana said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? And David said, To buy the threshing floor from you, to build an altar to the Lord that the plague may be withdrawn from the people. Now Arana said to David, let my lord the king take and offer up whatever seems good to him. Look, here are oxen for burnt sacrifice and threshing implements and yokes of oxen for wood. All these, O king, Arana has given to the king. And Arana said to the king, may the lord your God accept you. Then the king said to Arana, no, but I will surely buy it from you for a price. Nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God, with which costs me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen, oxen for 50 shekels of silver, and David built there an altar to the Lord, and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. 
So the Lord heeded the prayers for the land, and the plague was withdrawn from Israel. Thank you, brother. Great reading. Now, pay attention to a couple little things. You know, we come into the conclusion of King David's life. By the way, uh, Arana means Jehovah is firm, Yahweh is firm, God is firm. Mm -hmm. Perfectly fitting for where we are. This guy's name, right after, is, his name means God is firm, Jehovah is firm. You know, and he has to be. Because, you see, here, David's life, we're coming to the end of it. This is, this is the end of chapter 24, next uh, next book is basically First Kings, Book of Kings. There's no first and second in the Old Testament in, in the Hebrew version of it, but anyway, it's in English is divided into. It doesn't matter. Still, it's Kings, and it talks about the in, by the end of chapter one of the second book. You, God bless you. We'll have, we'll see his son, you know, Solomon come into power. So uh, that would be from there on moving on to the, the, the to Solomon and so on and so forth. So David was chosen by God after his own heart over King Saul because we see even though David has committed much larger, okay, and major mistakes than Saul, because if you think about it, if we were judges, if we are, we're not looking at it as a Bible, we're looking as judges. Listen to me really quick. And all, all of you have been to Saul's life, all of you, and all of you have been to David's life, Yes. And if we are just secular judges, not looking at it as biblical, which king we think was less, broke less the laws? Or which king was better king? Saul was, who, who committed less mistakes or less sins or less desire? Saul. Saul didn't do that much. David, oh Lord, every other day was messing up. You know? So, you know, but the thing is, Bible that God picked David over Saul. Okay? See, even though his mistakes were major, but always referred to the Lord, he always referred back to the Lord and asked for forgiveness. Entrusted into the Lord versus King Saul was all about himself and his pride and what he wanted to do. That's the difference that we needed to learn from. The difference between King Saul and King David, what we have to learn about is... King Saul was about him. King David was about God. From day one. He always said, even when they were taking the kingdom away from him, he goes, if that's what it is, that's what it is. If my son wants it, if that's God's plan, let it be. That man was attacking him and cussing him out, calling him names, let it be. If that's God's will, and that's what it should be. If that person is going to attack me, and that's the way God's will is, then I'm okay with it. If not, then the Lord will deal with it. So we learned so much from David because David always trusted in God's judgment versus his judgment. Because his judgment sucked. Anyway, he didn't do anything good about it. He, it was a mess. But he always trusted God to take care of it. Versus Saul was always him. Even when the, the prophet Samuel was late, you know, he's like, I'll do the sacrifice. You can't do the sacrifice. You're not the priest. You're the king. Act like one. Stay where you are. That's not your job. So these are the kind of things we, that the difference is. Even though Saul didn't commit that many bad things like David did, but David always knew when to go back and ask for forgiveness. Always. If Adam, Adam, Genesis, Chapter 1, 2, 3. If he asks for forgiveness instead of blaming the woman and telling God, it's your fault, you gave her to me. You, it's your fault. God's like, uh, I wish that was the part that... I can't wait to actually watch the real movie when I get to heaven. I really want to watch that verse. That's like, I want to watch it like over and over and over when that conversation happened. Because in the Bible, there was... Because could you... Because I'm sure God will have been like, hold on a second. Let me rewind a little bit when the day you first met her. And you were like, ho, 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 wow, he's so hot, I love it, I can't wait, oh, this is it. And then what, a few months later, a few years later, whatever it is, we don't know. And then God's like, and he's like, the woman you gave me, 
the woman you gave me, she made me do it. Not me. It's not my fault. I didn't do nothing. It's between you and her. You guys deal with this. It's your problem, God, and she's the fault. You gave her to me, you deal with her, not me. So you see, but you imagine. Sounds like a divorced man. Imagine. <laughs> imagine. If, imagine if Adam, our first Adam, if all he had to do is come out and say, Lord, I'm sorry, we messed up. We need your help. We don't know what to do. I wasn't thinking correctly. If you just laid on his face and asked for forgiveness, I would think we had a better outcome. We would have had a better chance. But because he came out with his, you know, with speedos, with the, with the fig leaves, he was wearing a speedo fig leaves tied up in each other and stuff. Yeah. He's like, I'm here. Uh, why are you hiding? Because I'm naked. Uh, hello, can't you see? Speedo. And God's like, uh, how do you know you're naked? Wow. I never told you you could be naked. What does that mean? That means you ate from the tree when I told you not to, right? Well, let me correct you on that, Lord. You know that woman? That one over there is hiding. She's also wearing a speedo, some kind of something in her bikini. Her, she is the one. She made me, the one you gave. That, that's the woman. He didn't even say her name. He said, the woman you gave me. <laughs> She's the one. It's her fault. She did it. Well, she did it. I should say it this way. She did it. And that's the... So bottom line is, if we had Adam was asking for forgiveness like David did in all those times, we, would, we as mankind would not be in the situation we are right now. But because Adam didn't want to accept his mistake and own up to it, or man up to it, and stand up and say, well, you know, Lord, I'm sorry, I messed up. Just, that's all he should have said. I messed up. Not even blame her. Leave her out of the picture. It's my fault. I'm the man. I take it. Do what you got to do with me. I messed up. The Lord could have been for, merciful and forgiving, or change, you know, he would have not. But, eh, it is what it is. Here we are. Yeah, well, God knew this would happen. Yes. He knew the nature of us, and that we would want to be in charge. That's what the tree of knowledge yeah. of good and evil is. Yes. There's being... no way to create such a tree. That's the problem without Christianity, without the Bible, without the law of God. There's no standard of good. So everybody else is kind of like nuts, and they're trying to create stuff out of nothing. And there's no basis for anything. And so... God. The next point in this, who knows what the next point is? The next point before we wrap it up. Uh, don't uh, give something for God that didn't cost you. Wow, well, bravo! Welcome. I'm so glad. ZC badge. <laughs> I know she's got uh, too many badges today. So we finish up the book. You get a medal today. Yalla. We're gonna be made of honor. What was that she said? Go ahead. Say it again so that everybody can hear a little louder. <laughs> Because the properties of Arana was offered to the King David, including all the animals for the sacrifice, for free. But David said, no, 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 no. He goes, I know the rules better than this. No, I don't want nothing for free. If I'm going to sacrifice something to God and I'm going to erect this, I want to buy it in whatever fair price is. I'm going to pay for it. So absolutely, he says, no, I will give the Lord that which costs me nothing. I must pay for it and it's for it to be real. The question to all of us is, do we give God from abundance, from the extra, from the leftover, from our time that is not needed anymore? Or do we give from the heart, from the importance, from what we need the most? Again, not, not, not just money, okay? So automatically when I say these things, people right away go into the money. It's not a tithing, it's not just money, people. It's your time, it's your... First one. You don't know how, how many you will have after. So you just keep whatever you got. Yes. First fruits, first born, first paycheck, first money, first time. When you have time, you shouldn't say, oh, well, you know, I'll go and do this. I'll go and visit the people in the hospital when I have some time extra. You're never going to have that time. Just so you remember that. 
But that's not acceptable in God's kingdom if you're just going to go and just do it just because you have extra time left or you want to give money away to the, to the church because now you have a little extra. Not when, no, you need to give it when you don't have it. You need to serve when you don't have the time. You know, I had a very busy week and I haven't had a funeral in a long time. And they said, and they called me and they go, oh, we need you. I'm like all excited. It was a Saturday, like the only day I'm off. Only day I'm off. All the rest of the week, I got things to do. You know, on Saturday, I'm going to rest. I want to just chill and do nothing. Maybe go to the pool. That was my plan. But, and guess what time? 10 o'clock in the morning. That means I cannot even sleep in because you go to a funeral, I got to dress up. So, but the point is, well, that's serving God. You have to go there and, and minister to people in God's words. You have to go do it when it's non-convenient to you. Then it's sacrificial to God. When it's non-convenient for you. Amen? Amen? So with that, we conclude our Second Samuel, book of Second Samuel in the Old Testament. And may the Lord bless you. May the Lord bless you. Shine His face upon you. May the Lord prosper you. May the Lord keep you in His peace. May the Lord have mercy on all of you. May the Lord just keep on showing you how to love like He did love us. So on resurrection day, we all be together again. So when the time comes, we don't skip a beat. We won't sit and go, oh, what if? Oh, I should have. Oh, I would have. I'm ready, Lord. <clears throat> Serve your king. Go and serve your king. Go serve him. Go love others. That's what serving is. Go love others. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching, everybody. We'll see you again on Wednesday, God's willing.